before we get into maybe some of the more dynamics of how mutual aid works um, on the ground, um, what was I know that you've been in a lot of these situations. You, from what I understand, you've been to Puerto Rico after Hurricane uh, Maria hit. Uh, you worked on the mm-hmm. ground there. What is your experience that with how people react to these disaster scenarios that we're seeing more and more of as the, as you mentioned, climate catastrophe continues uh, to unfold on this planet. You mean the impacted communities themselves? Yes. Yeah. Like how, how do people react to these disasters in your experience? In, in every situation that I have been um, able to be a part of, I've witnessed communities literally like doing the work to take care of each other and, the the biggest hurdle that communities have faced in my in my view just as is my reflection is you know the kind of barriers and um, bottlenecks that these government institutions and nonprofits have put up for them but i there was so much um community um uh, autonomous response particularly in Puerto Rico with these um centers of um mutual aid that that opened up across the island when um you know when the the government completely uh failed to give any kind of response and actually like turned around and critiqued the people as if they had no interest in their own recovery and they were doing nothing to you know pull themselves together which was exactly the narrative that was propped up again and again and again in the whole time that this was going on and this narrative was being circulated the people of Puerto Rico had pulled together they had created community kitchens with no power, with no running water, with their streets in ruins, with their homes in ruins, with their roofs gone, they were, you know, doing hundreds of meals a day in the community. They were um, organizing autonomous, um, like, uh, water brigades and community spaces and um, spaces where people could get medical um, support and medical access. Um, you know, uh, people were organizing for their neighbors to be able to get access to their things like insulin that, that you know, you can't sustain in a situation where your power is out. So it was a, a really, um, I mean, it continues to this day, a really like powerful, powerful movement from the streets, from this grassroots, um, you know, stunning um, movement that has to this day continued to support people in the rebuilding process, you know, as, you know, and, um, you know, I've, I've seen it again and again, like in, in, uh, in New Orleans and the lower ninth ward and in the Carolinas across Florida, you know, it's just been, um, something that repeats itself. Cause like I said, people revert to that, you know, natural state of cooperation and autonomous response in the absence of the state, setting up these barricades in front of them and saying, you know, we know what you need and we're going to give it to you. And, you know, criminalizing people for, you know, this quote looting, which is, you know, an, another narrative, another toxic narrative that that's put out because capital needs to de- defend capital. That's its first priority. That's its only priority. And at the, at the, um, you know, at the expense of people getting things they need to survive, like, uh, you know, not to go on and on, but in, in the Carolinas were a dollar store. This wasn't a Macy's or a Saks Fifth Avenue. This was a dollar store where the manager was giving people things, openly giving people things. And the police moved in and arrested people and charged people that had undergone a severe, you know, a deadly historical hurricane and charged them with felonies and changed looting to a felony offense, you know, so... Mm. Um, yeah, the cooperation I've seen in these communities has been, you know, really incredible. 